Great, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, my topic is as you see, and uh, you see my disclosures, and I will mention that I have uh, provided consulting advice for uh, a couple of the companies that are connected with agents that I will speak about, so please bear that in mind. So I think large cell lymphoma is well known to this group. It's the most common uh, form of lymphoma. Uh, you see the characteristic uh, pathology. Obviously the goal is to cure these patients. Across the board we cure somewhere around two-thirds of patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And the diagnosis is obviously made on pathology and the characteristic immunophenotyping as well as uh, fish testing, immunohistochemistry testing for the elements as noted in order to try to characterize the subtype of lymphoma and perhaps the prognostic features of an individual patient's uh, situation. So I think it's important for any talk in large cell lymphoma to keep in mind the International Prognostic Index. We get all caught up and excited about the sexy gene expression profiling and the marker of the day, but the reality is, is that the IPI has been around uh, now for over 25 years and is the, is the most robust way to prognosticate. I sat uh, in my clinic seeing a patient uh, this week and told him his IPI score. Unfortunately, I didn't have any uh, way to use his IPI score to treat him any differently. And so I think it's sobering that we can have a prognostic score that is so robust and yet very little uh, way where that can measurably impact a patient's outcome uh, by changing treatment. So I think this group likely knows that the general large cell lymphoma standard of care is RCHOP21. And what you see in front of you are studies in older patients, younger patients, uh, and various forms, all showing on the left progression-free survival and on the right overall survival um, with the addition of rituximab to CHOP chemotherapy. And so the idea that we can improve upon this, um, because you see that there's obviously room uh, to go as far as uh, curing more patients, I think uh, it's fair to say has been pretty elusive. And so the focus of the rest of this talk is really to talk about the ways that we've tried to improve this, where we have not had success, and where we've maybe had a little bit of success in moving forward, as well as certain subtypes where if you're seeing these patients, you may want to use something differently. So unfortunately, there have been uh, a number of negative studies. I've been a part of a few of these, uh, as of others in the room. And I think it's fair to say that as of today, adding bortezomib, consolidating with autotransplant using dose-adjusted R epoch, or adding a brutinib or lenalidomide uh, really has not been compelling or in fact been stone cold negative in trying to uh, improve upon our CHOP for subsets of patients. So I'm gonna just give you um, some of the information that's at least thought provoking uh, on a couple uh, of these approaches. I'm not gonna talk about the first two, but because particularly the latter two are relatively new, uh, it's worth uh, noting and perhaps a little clear cut. And then the dose adjusted R epoch still is potentially used in a couple of situations that I'll get into. So uh, first, uh, the Alliance CLGB 50303 study published uh, by Nancy Bartlett uh, in JCO earlier this year, randomized patients to R CHOP versus R epoch. As you know, R epoch is an infusional regimen that is more complicated, has more toxicity, and the idea was that uh, this could improve efficacy based on the, the different dosing uh, pattern and the addition of etoposide. Unfortunately, kind of across the board looking at all comers, while there's some nuances to this, I think it's fair to say that there's no clear evidence of improvement of, uh, in event-free survival or overall survival uh, through the use of dose-adjusted R epoch. So we'll come back to this a little later in a few subsets where maybe there's a hint that this could be useful, but I think uh, it, we really don't have any definitive information at this point that uh, using the dose-adjusted R epoch regimen is worth the hassle or the toxicity for the vast majority of patients. So obviously, uh, the world of large cell lymphoma, uh, again, being humbled, going back to the IPI, been around for 25 years. Uh, now the uh, identification of germinal center or activated B cell subtype now been around for over 15 years um, that got everyone very excited about the idea of subsetting large cell lymphoma into different uh, entities and treating patients uh, differently based on the fact that the germinal center subtype has a much more favorable outcome in these retrospective studies compared to the activated B cell subtype. 
And so the concept that there are a number of different targets, some of which you've heard over the course of this meeting, whether it's BCL2 translocations, EZH2 mutations as an example of uh, agents or areas that we could target in the germinal center subset versus a variety of different mutations such as the B cell receptor signaling uh, and other uh, NF-kappa B, other pathways that could be targeted in the ABC subtype. And so the pattern, as you well know, is to try to take one of these subsets and add into our CHOP a drug that could be preferentially active or relevant uh, within a subset, in particular the ABC subset, where uh, the prognosis is less favorable with our CHOP, generally speaking. And so over the last year, we've had uh, a couple of examples of these uh, attempts, which I think uh, uh, are very important and admirable attempts, but uh, albeit unsuccessful attempts. This is the Phoenix trial led by Anas Yunus, published in JCO early this year, adding a brutinib, which has potential activity in the ABC subtype. Um, this looked at non-GCB subtype as established by IHC, advanced stage disease primarily patients, looking at event-free survival as the primary endpoint and other standard parameters. You see that the primary endpoint of this study was event-free survival, and whether you look at the intent to treat based on non-GCB or the ABC subset, you see really no difference in the entire population when you add a brutinib to RCHOP. There was also more toxicity with a brutinib, as you would expect uh, when added to RCHOP. However, there was this glimmer of uh, interest that in the younger patients, perhaps a brutinib uh, added some value. Uh, this can be interpreted in a number of different ways. Um, some would speculate, and, and there was some data presented, that there was more toxicity in the older patients, and the younger patients were able to tolerate the abrutinib better, uh, and that allowed them to reap the benefits. On the other hand, um, these cutoffs were uh, somewhat retrospectively defined, and there are a number of different um, explanations why this isn't quite robust, mostly the limitations of retrospective subset uh, analysis, retrospectively de defined subset analyses. So, I think this remains an open question. Some people are still pursuing this. Uh, we are looking at a brutinib in the alliance with uh, the transplant group, uh, looking at a brutinib in the non-GCB subset in relapse large cell lymphoma, but I would say that as of today, uh, there's really not uh, good evidence that the addition of a brutinib uh, should be uh, incorporated into RCHOP uh, therapy based on the overall negative results of this study. The other area that's been of interest is lenalidomide, which has had also had activity in the non-GCB subtype. There were two studies presented at the Lugano meeting. Some of you may have seen these, others uh, didn't, and I don't think they've been published uh, yet, if I'm not mistaken. The first was a randomized phase two trial, ecog swag and Alliance, taking large cell lymphoma patients, randomizing them to RCHOP for six cycles, or RCHOP with lenalidomide, or R squared CHOP, looking at, um, and then stratifying and looking at the patients by nanostring and immunohistochemistry to look at the subset that were non-GCB. The primary endpoint was in all patients with large cell lymphoma with a co-primary endpoint of the ABC subtype as defined by nanostring. You can see some of the statistical assumptions there. These results were quite interesting in that R squared CHOP uh, appeared uh, better in efficacy with regard to progression free survival, whether you look at all patients or you look at the ABC subtype as determined by nanostring, you see some of the numbers there. So this uh, was exciting, again, remembering that this was a randomized phase two trial kind of in parallel and presented at the same session at Lugano was the robust study. This was a larger phase three trial looking at untreated large cell lymphoma patients, 570 patients uh, focusing on the, uh, the subset, the ABC subset, again, uh, as identified and uh, uh, looked at by nanostring. Uh, only the ABC subset were, were randomized here, and again, you see R squared CHOP versus uh, placebo with the stratifications uh, as noted. Unfortunately, in this trial, the more robust phase three trial, focusing again on the ABC subtype, no difference between R squared CHOP and placebo uh, R CHOP. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, kind of taking the wind out of the sails of adding lenalidomide uh, to our chop based therapy. So what are the explanations or what are the potential explanations for these um, confounding results or why do these drugs, ibrutinib, lenalidomide, not uh, add anything here? Well, you see a, a comparison of the two studies and uh, 
Again, uh, there were differences in the identification of the subset, the number of patients, location of the patients. I think two big factors, the, do the dosing and schedule of lenalidomide differed in the trial, so to the extent that that makes a difference. And then I think this bottom feature, which we've learned more and more, is the diagnosis to treatment interval being uh, about a month versus 22 days in the positive trial. And the concept that we've learned more and more about in large cell lymphoma in all of the studies uh, in upfront disease and that have been reported in the last couple of years is that diagnosis of treatment correlates with outcome, that studies that have processes that take a long time or that are limited one reason or another to patients that can wait around to go on the study tend to exclude, uh, perhaps inadvertently, less favorable patients, the ones that can benefit from the intervention, and therefore the control arm does better because the less favorable patients are not entering the study. So this is clearly an issue in large cell lymphoma, whether or not that has to do with why this, uh, this uh, discrepancy occurred between these trials is uncertain, but certainly uh, these, uh, again, are not compelling for the addition at this point of lenalidomide to our CHOP based on uh, this package of data. The other aspect of this is has gotten very uh, more complicated is the fact that the genetics and pathogenesis of large cell lymphoma has been further elucidated and instead of this germinal center uh, and uh, ABC subtype, we have a couple of studies, one by Lou Stout's group, one by Margaret Ship's group, um, at where we have additional subsets of large cell lymphoma where these mutations or these pathways may be more specifically restricted to and therefore uh, really the effects of these additional interventions are getting diluted out by a patient population that is actually only narrowly potentially impacted by these uh, pathways and interventions. And so uh, you see that we now have a more complicated subsetting and perhaps a more specific subset for these targets to be explored further. And so how we will take this for further uh, in this uh, slicing and dicing of the DLBCL population in a precision sort of approach, I think, makes a lot of sense, but also has a lot of practical challenges in how you actually get uh, studies done to test these hypotheses and these interventions in these subsets of patients. So with that, for most patients, we're still on our CHOP uh, on a 21-day cycle as a standard therapy. Um, but for the rest of the, my uh, remarks, I just want to comment on several other scenarios where perhaps uh, our CHOP times 6 is not the best treatment, um, recognizing that um, the randomized data su supporting any of the things I'm going to talk about are relatively limited, um, except for one or two specific cases. So the first is in, uh, in limited stage large cell lymphoma. We go back to the uh, SWOG 8736 study showing comparability between CHOP for times three and evolved field radiation and CHOP times eight. So there have been a number of efforts to uh, refine the therapy of limited stage large cell lymphoma. This is the S0014, looking at RCHOP for three cycles, uh, plus involved field radiation. Again, quite good outcomes here. So the question has then been, well, do you need the radiation? Can we use a PET-adapted approach? We have some data from the uh, BC Cancer Group. Uh, Laurie Sen has reported on data looking at RCHOP uh, for three cycles and then based on the PET, either giving one more cycle uh, of RCHOP or giving involved field radiation. And I think this has in practice become adopted by a number of groups, particularly in the PET negative group where outcomes are good uh, if patients are PET negative. That has been looked at in a, uh, I would say, a uh, prospective way, in a bigger way as well at the ASH meeting last year. The Flyer study took uh, generally favorable patients, uh, age-adjusted IPI zero patients without bulky disease, randomized them to RCHOP for six cycles versus RCHOP for four cycles, plus a little extra uh, rituximab, of course. It kind of finds its way into these studies. And the net is that with four cycles of RCHOP, and this was not PET adapted, um, that uh, patients did quite well. And so I think um, more and more we're moving toward um, the use of uh, or lack of use of involved field radiation in patients uh, uh, with limited stage uh, large cell lymphoma. And we will see 
we uh, presented at ASH, the S1001 study, Daniel Persky's presenting. I know this is a little small to see, I apologize. Uh, but it's uh, RCHOP times three cycles, the PET negative patients getting one cycle more of RCHOP, the PET positive patients um, with a less favorable prognosis getting an intensified treatment with radiation and radioimmunotherapy consolidation being PET positive uh, in order to consolidate them. So those data will be presented uh, later this year. So another big area that's getting a lot of attention in large cell lymphoma is the double hit versus the double protein. Uh, there are a lot of data on, on these uh, entities, the double hit being uh, expressing or having translocations of MYC along with BCL2 BCL or BCL6 or, or both. These are typically of the germinal center subtype and do very poor with standard therapies. The double expressing proteins uh, are uh, expressors, not translocated, but expressors of MYC and BCL2. These tend to be in the ABC subtype and are kind of intermediate in their prognosis. Here's, uh, they, this, these entities are kind of a Venn diagram, as you can see, with the ABC uh, group, uh, ABC subset uh, owning more of the double expressors, the GCB subset uh, owning more of the translocated patients, uh, and particularly the double hits. And so uh, how to take this forward? Well, the data suggests from a variety of different series, this is one, uh, that show that the double hit patients do quite poorly. The double expressors have an intermediate outcome. There are a lot of nuances to this, but uh, this is the bottom line. And so uh, the question is, how should we treat these patients? Um, the double expressors seem to do, uh, seem to not benefit from dose-adjusted RE POC based on the, uh, uh, the alliance data at this point, at least to the extent that we can look at this. There are a variety of studies suggesting that the dose-adjusted or EPOC regimen can have benefit, not in comparative randomized trials, but can have benefit in a double-hit lymphoma subtype. And I think most people would argue that the double-hit patients should be treated more aggressively. And I would say most commonly dose-adjusted or EPOC seems to be uh, what is used. I will, will mention that the Alliance is leading a recently activated study in double-hit and double-expressor patients led by Jeremy uh, Abram where uh, patients are randomized to our chemotherapy, either our CHOP if they're double expressors, or our EPOC if they're double hit, with or without venetoclax, the inhibitor BCL2. So that study is just activated, and I would encourage you, if you're a cooperative group participant, to explore participation in that trial that will see if uh, the addition of venetoclax can improve chemoimmunotherapy in these patients. I just want to wrap up with a couple uh, of points around uh, CNS progression. This is, I think, in meetings like this, whenever people present cases or have questions, do you prophylax uh, who's at risk for CNS uh, involvement? And I think uh, this is probably the, the closest to the state of the art of who is likely uh, to have CNS, or more likely, I should say, to have CNS involvement. We have the CNS IPI, and one of the factors is kidney or adrenal uh, gland involvement, as well as age, uh, and then LDH, uh, advanced uh, perfor or impaired performance status, advanced disease. All of these correlate with outcome, but again, they, these are generally high IPI risk patients, and then this uh, kidney and adrenal uh, gland involvement, and you can see that this can lead to uh, uh, up to about a 15% risk uh, of CNS involvement. The question of how you prevent this or deal with this, I think, is an open question, whether intrathecal chemotherapy prophylactically uh, makes a difference is, I think, uh, open to debate. Certainly, these are patients you might screen more carefully and uh, evaluate their CSF. Uh, for this possibility. I think many of us have adopted uh, this regimen that Jeremy Abramson has reported on a series uh, retrospectively of giving day 14 methotrexate, 3.5 grams, um, for a couple of cycles uh, on day 15 of the R-CHOP cycle. Obviously, this is not a randomized trial, but in relatively uh, high-risk patients had relatively good outcomes with regard to CNS relapse uh, rate. And um, I think this has become a generally well-tolerated approach for this patient population that many centers including ours, have uh, commonly uh, adapted. Uh, I just want to end with dose-adjusted REPOC and primary mediastinal uh, lymphoma, uh, and this is a series from my colleague Lisa Roth, who looked at 
Uh, retrospective data uh, from a number of centers suggesting that dose adjusted our epoch, this was based on the NCI data, uh, had quite good event free survival uh, in patients, whether they were adult or pediatrics, and that the PET scan, particularly if you were DOVA 1 through 3, and even so, DOVA 4 could have good outcomes. These patients, some of which were radiated, most were not. And uh, the intergroup is now looking at an, a checkpoint inhibitor in combination with those suggested our EPOC in this patient population, checkpoint inhibitors uh, being approved in relapse uh, uh, primary mediastinal disease. Finally, the uh, other scenario where something else might be used, our mini-CHOP uh, has uh, accumulated substantial data in patients over the age of 80. This uh, attenuates doses of cyclofoxfamide, doxorubicin, and mincristine, uh, as you see. And the data with this approach, depending on your uh, performance status and uh, IADL score, uh, is associated in patients over the age of 80 with a fairly uh, reasonable outcome. Uh, and so this has become, I think, the default standard. The intergroup led by SWAG is advancing a study looking at our mini chop with or without azacitidine as a hypomethylating agent to see if that can improve uh, the uh, efficacy of our mini chop based on data from Leandro Kerchetti, who was here uh, this morning. And I think this is an interesting study that uh, if you see older patients with large cell lymphoma, maybe one that you want to consider uh, opening at your center. So with that, I will thank you very much for your attention, and we'll talk more later in the question session. Thank you.